Cool. Ja, dann wieder herzlich willkommen hier einmal in der Seabase und äh, draußen an den Endgeräten beim 15. Netzpolitischen Abend jetzt schon. Und ähm, sehr schön, dass ihr alle da seid, trotz des extrem heißen Wetters. Deswegen haben wir heute auch so ein bisschen andere Planung gemacht, weil das ja schon abzusehen war. Wir fangen früher an, haben nur einen Talk und ähm, dann geht es raus ab zum Grillen. Äh, Bier gibt es wie immer hier drin und Mate und alles Mögliche. Und ähm, wir haben heute einen ganz besonderen Gast, Geraldine. Achso, wir sollten uns vielleicht noch mal kurz vorstellen. Geraldine, Linnea, Digitale Gesellschaft und ähm, du machst weiter, wer überhaupt Tolles heute da ist. Die wunderbare Gillian York von der Electronic Frontier Foundation ist heute extra zu uns gekommen und ähm, ist auch die einzige Speakerin, die wir heute haben. Das heißt, Gillian wird gleich einen kurzen Vortrag halten und danach werden wir eure Fragen entgegennehmen, nehmen, Q&A machen und wenn ihr dann alle soweit seid und ausgefragt habt, dann gehen wir raus und grillen zusammen. Genau, noch einmal, weil ich letztes Mal das fünfmal erwähnt habe, dass Tactical Tech heute sprechen wird. Nochmal vielen Dank, dass äh, alle von Ihnen gefühlt da sind. <lacht> ähm, aber, und ihr werdet nächstes Mal Tactical Tech hören. Wir sind äh, heute einfach ein bisschen runtergefahren aufgrund des Wetters und dass wir Jillian einfach ähm, ein bisschen länger sprechen lassen wollen. Das Ganze wird natürlich auf Englisch wieder stattfinden. Und... Ähm, Genau, und noch so als äh, Ansage wie immer, wir werden, also wir übertragen natürlich und filmen deswegen auch und wenn ihr nicht gesehen werden wollt, wenn ihr eure Fragen stellt, dann macht das am besten da unter dem Rundbogen, das wäre dann der beste Platz. Genau, und falls irgendjemand zuschaut, der kein Deutsch spricht, extra weil Gillian heute ist, sage ich das Ganze nochmal ganz, ganz schnell auf Englisch. Um, welcome everybody to our 15th Net Political Evening. We're very glad you could all join us despite the hot weather today. We have a really nice evening program planned for you. We're super glad that Gillian from the Electronic Frontier Foundation could join us this evening to speak to us. She'll be giving her talk in just a minute and then we'll be going for a Q&A. And after that, we'd all like to invite you all to a barbecue outside and hope the weather will hold out for as long as possible. And with that, I think I'd like to pass the mic. Any other announcements? <laughs> Maybe only that um, we're glad if you could give us a little bit of money um, if you eat something. Um, yeah. And maybe also talking about supporting members, um, always keep in mind that we're looking for new ones and um, we're glad if you would join us and very thankful that we already have that many and um, hopefully see a couple of you tonight and talk to you guys. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks. All right, with that, enjoy. Thanks. Mike is yours. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you. Jillian, that you're here. Coming from San Francisco or Amsterdam, sort of. <laughs> uh, in the way. Well, actually, coming coming from uh, Ohm, so coming from camp, um, which I think means that I'm feeling a little bit more optimistic than usual, um, which is hard when you're talking about surveillance. But after spending a week with people who care about this as much as you do, you, I think, feel a little bit better. So I highly recommend it. Um, so let me just give you a little bit of background on myself and what brought me to this topic um, so to frame this. I've been working on issues related to both internet network censorship and surveillance for the better part of the past six years, from academic work to the work that I do at the EFF now. And when I first started looking at surveillance, I was looking at it specifically in the Middle East and North Africa. So this was about five or six years ago. And what I was seeing was US or European built tools being sold to governments in that part of the world and used by those governments to spy on people. So in your head, that's a very simple problem in a way. I mean, it's, it doesn't have a simple solution as some of my colleagues here that are working on it will know. Um, but it's, it's easy to say, okay, bad company, bad government, you know, people good, here's this, blah, blah, blah. So, When I moved to EFF a couple of years ago, I started in 2011, um, I was already aware of their work a little bit, but I'll be honest, I don't, I've never really worked on US issues. Um, most of my work does take place in other parts of the world. Um, I do a lot of work you know, helping to build up new organizations in different countries, um, other types of advocacy work, but I was not 
completely up to speed on all of the, the information about the NSA um, until about two years ago when I got TFF and immediately got this crash course in everything that had been going on. Um, and so I'm not sure how much history you all know, and I know it's hot, so I don't want to like drag you through it, but I'll just give you the really quick point by point one um, to make sure everyone's on the same page. So in 2005, um, a man walked into EFF's offices and handed over a briefcase full of information that showed that the NSA was working with AT&T, one of our major telecoms, um, to surveil US citizens, specifically collecting metadata on US citizens, as well as foreigners. Um, and that, of course, as most of you probably know, was Mark Klein. Um, and that information enabled us to build two, as an organization, to build two uh, court cases, um, one of which was against the NSA. I'm just going to make peek at my notes so that I don't get any of this wrong and get fact-checked by anyone later. <laughs> Details. Also, I'm not a lawyer. I should probably say that outright. Um, okay, so. So. The lawsuit against the NSA, Juul versus the NSA, we filed it in 2008, um, and the aim of that was the exactly the aim of our advocacy work now, which was to end, put an end to the dragnet surveillance of um, US citizens as well as non-US citizens. Um, and in 2009, the Obama administration moved to dismiss that lawsuit on the ground of state secrets. Um, in 2011, so there was a bunch of other things that went on in between there, again, not getting into the details, but. In 2011, a court ruled to dismiss it, and then the Ninth, um, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled for the case to proceed. So that's where we were up until the revelations that happened this summer. And when the leaks um, that Edward Snowden released that were um, leaked by Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras and others came forward, we were able to move forward on that case, and, and a court actually rejected the Obama administration's state secret order. So we are moving forward with the Jewel versus NSA case. Um, that's about as much detail as I have at this point. Again, not being a lawyer and having been on holiday for the past month, um, I will. I look forward to hearing the newest. Um, but that's only a part of our, our work on this issue. Um, in addition to that particular court case, which has been ongoing for many years now, as you can see, five years at this point, we also have done um, a significant amount of FOIA work, Freedom of Online, uh, sorry, um, Freedom of Information Act. Uh, so to get public records, many of which have also been rejected on state secrets grounds. Those cases continue. Um, and then in addition to that, we've also done a lot of public advocacy work um, and policy work to try to um, get a, tr uh, a sort of a new church committee on transparency within the Congress, uh, to hold public officials accountable, and to get the public invested in and engaged with this issue. Um, because what we're seeing in the US right now, which quite different from what you're seeing here, of course. What you're seeing in the US is a lot of sort of complacency and even acceptance of this as a normal thing. Um, and I, I mean, I, I don't think anyone would disagree with me when I say this is not okay. And so in the US, part of that struggle is it's not just the legislation. It's not just trying to, you know, to successfully build these cases so that we can defeat existing um, frameworks, but it's also getting the public to care about this. And to this point, what we've seen is this mentality of, I have nothing to hide, and therefore, this is not a big deal. I I'm not going to get into the f philosophy of that, because I think that that's already been discussed in recent weeks, but I I'm sure you can see why that's so problematic, the idea that I have nothing to hide. And I would push back on that and say, okay, well, if you have nothing to hide, then send me all of your emails, release all of your private data, and while you're at it, I'd like your nude photos, too. Um, but as you know, that's not the case. The idea of we have nothing to hide is one that, you know, I'm not a criminal, I haven't done anything wrong, therefore the government watching me is not a problem. Um, but as many of my friends, both in the US and outside of the US can attest, that's not the case. Um, so just to bring this back into the, the other work that we do, um, we recently put together a set of principles um, on the application of human rights uh, to communication surveillance. And this was signed by, at this point, I think over 150 organizations, um, I think some of which might be represented here, I'm not quite sure. But I, I'm, I'm not that interested in a debate over this principle or that principle, but what I'm seeing here is a global coalescence of 
interested organizations, but not just interested, but organizations that are invested in defeating this, not just in their home countries, but also in the US and also in other countries where they're affected by it. And looking at what the US is doing, not just to its own citizens, we know that this has overstepped um, the, the existing frameworks. We know that the NSA, it, it, that it's unconstitutional for the NSA to spy on US citizens. All of that work is our problem. Not, <laughs> unless you're American, not your problem, really. Um, but when it comes to the surveillance, the dragnet surveillance of foreign, uh, non-US citizens, rather, it's something that you know I'm not sure that we're going to be able to get US citizens to care about. And so a lot of our work has been talking to people in other countries and trying to build this movement to influence the US in that way, which is seemingly impossible. And like I said at the beginning, um, I had been rather pessimistic until this week. And I think the only thing that's keeping me from being so pessimistic is talking to people that are actually building tools not to defeat this, but to circumvent it. Um, because I'm at this point not so convinced that we can affect meaningful policy change in the US around this and defeat the surveillance state. These networks, or not networks, but these systems are by this point so entrenched that it seems, here comes the pessimism again, it seems absolutely impossible to defeat them from either you know, working through Congress or through the litigation that EFF does. Um, and while I really do think that our work is incredibly important in this area, and I do think that we will make strides with this case and with our other cases to defeat certain elements, the fact remains that the architecture is still there. Um, I'm not a technologist, and so I don't have the answers to that question, but I'm, I'm just sort of moved and inspired by being around people who are working on it from that perspective, and I do think that that's really important. Um, I think that that's all I wanted to explain. I'm actually, since I'm, I'm not really sure what you're interested in, I'd actually be more um, open to just opening this up and taking questions at this point. Um, and I'm happy to answer them if I can. So thank you. OK, you really. Did only use 10 to 15 minutes. That was <laughs> almost sorry, too quick for me. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're all sweating, not only you, no worries. So, do you have any questions? Maybe. Ah, perfect. Sorry. Didn't see that. Apart from uh, the government side of things, are you looking at how? the corporations are using data like that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Hello, there we go. Um, yes, so in terms of what the corporations are doing, um, this is the part where I'm gonna start to say things that I probably shouldn't say on the record, but I'm going to anyway. Um, so, <laughs> let me think about how to frame this. So, raise your hand if you're familiar with something called the Global Network Initiative. A little bit, okay, that's good. Um, so in 2008, I wanna say, could be a little bit earlier, um, there was an initiative to hold companies accountable for um, both in terms of censorship and surveillance and their behavior in other countries. And this came about because of the, the incident with Yahoo, more than an incident, the guy's still in jail for Christ's sake. Um, the, the case where Yahoo um, handed over information to the Chinese government that resulted in a uh, prison sentence for the person whose information was handed over and whose name I can never pull out from the depths of my brain. Um, so the founding, or the founding uh, companies in this initiative were Yahoo, Google, um, and Microsoft, and since then Facebook has joined and several other smaller companies as well, including um, uh, WebSense, which builds filtering software that was at one point used in Yemen. So there has been some progress made there. But, um, and I say this as a member organization, where are the results? Um, we haven't seen any sort of multi-stakeholder initiative like that, where companies are put on the same level as advocacy organizations. We haven't seen that work, and I see no reason why it won't fail, to be perfectly honest. I don't see any... I mean, if you look at what the companies are up against in the US, I would actually say that it's far worse than what they're up against in other countries because it's, it's easy 
frankly, for Google to say to Jordan, which just um, enacted new press laws that ended up censoring several hundred sites, it's easy for Google to say no to the Jordanian government and to back out if they want to. That market is not their primary market. Sure, it's a big market. They do have offices there. But if Jordan all of a sudden tomorrow became more of a dictatorship than it already is, Google could walk away. Google doesn't have that choice. And I'm, I'm using Google as a stand-in for all of these companies. Google doesn't have that choice in the US. And so when they're faced with a secret order, their choices are to not, not to defy it, really. I mean, what they don't have that choice. Their choices are to fight to make it public, fight to make that information transparent, or to d do it. And so far, we've seen little effort from them. And so they've, they've just kind of gone in. And now, of course, now that all of this stuff is out there in the open, now the companies are saying, oh, well, now we're going to fight in the courts to make sure that we can um, make this information, or at least the fact that we're doing this public and available to customers. But you know, honestly, even Google in China, if you look at Google's transparency report in China, it says we can't share even the number of requests from the Chinese government because it's state secrets. And so if Google's willing to comply with the Chinese government on state secrets, I don't really see what hope we have. Um, as far as what else is being done with companies, I don't know. I gave up, I'm giving up Gmail. Um, but <laughs> uh, apart from that, I, I don't see what our choices are aside from building different infrastructure and refusing to accept what are, have essentially become imperialist companies. All right, that's a little harsh. Questions? Hi. Hi. Um, what do you think about, um, do you think that things are changing just the slightest bit in the United States? I mean, I'm, I'm referring kind of to an article that was written by Glenn Greenwald in The Guardian last Sunday. Um, in which he wrote extensively about Congress people who are now standing up and saying, hey, we've been writing letters, we've been trying to get information, we can't, we're seeing some changes happening in Congress, and I think we're at least seeing the hint of public opinion changing in the United States. Um, could this not indicate that things are maybe going to get better? So, one of the things that I love about Glenn Greenwald is that he will dump all of this information, and I, I don't just mean with the leaks, but I, I've, I've watched him speak, I know him personally. He'll dump all of this really horrible stuff and you'll be sitting there on the floor, like just, and, and then he'll say something optimistic to make it all better. And <laughs> like I saw him give this, talk, uh, give this talk about Guantanamo detainees and it was the most horrid thing, like the details that he was saying were absolutely horrid and then he just goes on to say, yes, but then this happened. And you're like, oh, it's all okay. Um, so, no, but to be honest, um, and I'm not criticizing him, I think it's actually a wonderful quality in a human. Um, is it actually changing? So there was a great quote that I wrote down, which was from Ron Wyden. So Senator Ron Wyden, um, probably maybe know of, um, won EFF's Pioneer Award actually two years ago um, for something, I think for something unrelated to this actually, but. He had this quote recently where he said that once Americans find out, uh, he, I think he's on the sub Senate Subcommittee for Intelligence, um, he said that once Americans see how Section 215 of the Patriot Act is being interpreted, they will be stunned and angry. So he has this information, he can't share this information, but he's furious about it. I would say that's about the amount of progress that we've made. And I, <laughs> I'm, thrilled, and if he were in my district, I would, I would vote for him. I mean, and I don't even vote, but um, <laughs> I'm thrilled that we have people like that who are standing up. I would still say that they're an extreme minority and that the way the political system works in the US is that money rules everything, and so when that minority gets a little too loud, chances are they will not be reelected. That may not be the case with him. Um, like I said, I mean, I, the other thing that I would note is that not to sound too much like an incredibly radical pessimist tonight, but one other thing that I would note is that we do, we have seen um, politicians from both sides of the party line come together on this, which is also good. And actually, I've been really surprised to see more Republicans than Democrats, I mean, I'm neither, but I'm, I'm surprised to see more Republicans than Democrats coming out against surveillance, which also sort of tested some of my own political biases. Like, oh, okay, so wait, now the right wing's on my side? Are we just playing a game of... Um, but as far as the public, I still think that it's an extreme minority that, that is following this, that is paying attention. Um, but I guess, 
I, I'm just, I'm really grateful to people like Glenn and to the Guardian itself and to every other, I mean, there, there's so many to name, but I'm really grateful to some of those more mainstream places doing all of this excellent journalism work to, to get people riled up. I'd like to follow up on that. Um, I think, I also think it's totally depressing what's happening and it's hard to be optimistic, but at the same time, um, I'm wondering, and I don't really know, um, or let me start with something else. Um, the US had SOPA PIPA, and no one thought that was possible, um, which is kind of the equivalent to the ACTA protests we had in Europe, which also nobody really thought before that that was gonna be possible. Because with these issues, you think nobody really cares and people are not gonna be in the street and it's really difficult. And I understand that the NSA is more difficult than SOPA PIPA. <laughs> but still, I would like to know, um, and is the EFF, I don't know if that's something you do, going to be involved in trying to actually do protests? So because because, because yeah. I think it's necessary now to yes. go in the street. I agree, so we already did one. So July 4th was take back the 4th, and by that we meant the 4th Amendment, not the 4th of July. So the 4th Amendment, which guarantees un uh, or protects against unreasonable search and seizure, just in case. Um, and we did, we did help organize, um, along with a coalition called Stop Watching Us, so it's stopwatching.us, um, which is mostly US organizations, some in, uh, international organizations, um, but that have all come together to not just do online protests, we, but we did get a ton of signatories nonetheless, um, but to also actually do, you know, actually go out on the street about this. Um, I would say though that I think the difference between SOPA and PIPA and this is not so much the, uh, the amount of action, although there was seemingly a bit more action um, from organizations on those, but the fact that Every teenager cares about SOPA and PIPA because it, you know, disables them from downloading the movies. Um, I mean, it's, there was, of course, you had a lot of more sort of high level people, you know, <laughs> involved in that, of course, for many more important reasons than that. But the fact of the matter is that as the public goes, if I can't download my stuff, I'm going to be pissed and I'm going to go and protest about it. And like I said, nobody cares about this. Nobody, I can't. I'm not seeing the public caring about this. I'm still seeing the nothing to hide mentality. But I agree with you, nonetheless. Way to go there, sorry. Do you want to stand there? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Hey. Hey. Oh, okay. So I actually, I had a comment and I was curious for your feedback, but so I'm also part of the Stop Watching Us Coalition and I may be a little bit more optimistic. Because in the last few weeks, um, we, in, within 24 hours, were able to garner, I think, over 10,000 calls to Congress on one amendment to defund what's called the Section 215. It's the domestic part of the NSA surveillance. Um, but I was also very involved in the SOPA PIPA movement. And what we saw there, it was over months and months and months. So within the groups involved in Stop Watching Us, the hope is that that was only the beginning. In fact, what happened was both the Obama administration um, issued it was a statement on an amendment, which is very rare in the US because it's only just a way to change a law. And then the NSA held an emergency briefing to try to lobby against it, and it was very close. And even though it was actually ultimately defeated, this is seen as a major first step in real reform. And also, for example, something like 81% of people under 35 support Snowden in certain polls. So you're seeing a generational difference as well, so those that are more digitally aware are more likely to support the issue. So I just want to provide some optimism for change. <laughs> thank you. And I want to hear your feedback, yeah. Yeah, no, no, thank you. And actually, I mean, I, just to be clear, I mean no criticism to the Stop Watching Us Coalition. I actually think it's, I think it's fantastic. Um, I haven't been that involved, but EFF has. Um, as far as the other stuff, I mean, I think that my pessimism so I actually, let me first accept, your, I think you're right about public opinion, and I think that I'm perhaps being too pessimistic there. I'm still pessimistic in the actual ability to change US policy. So I guess that's my feedback, but we can talk more about it over a beer. <laughs> yes. I agree. Uh, I, li I like the, the self-help tone of this uh, event that we are all trying to tell each other that there is still hope, although it's all <laughs> horrible. Um, as a European activist, uh, what kind of 
um, solidarity, what kind of actions uh, would you like to see from the European side? Uh, what would make uh, European activists a good ally to your cause? Oh God, I'm, not, I'm actually not sure I have a good answer to that. Um, let me think about that. I'm sorry that I don't have a good direct answer to that. Um, We're waiting in Yeah, no, but don't don't roll away for me. I mean, you've got you've got these guys. You've got. I mean, that's the thing. I think that. Um, I mean, I I'll be honest. I do less work in Europe because there are so many good European activists and organizations here. Um, but I I will think about that and try to. Yeah. <laughs> that would all help us. Is there anyone else perfect? Maybe there's first an answer there, and then I'm coming back to you. Hi, uh, I, nice to see you. Hi. Um, so uh, one thing I wanted to say is that uh, something you said really bothers me a lot. Um, well, several things, but I'll just focus on one, um, <laughs> which is uh, in a good way. I mean, it bothers me in a good way. But the one thing you said that bothered me in a bad way is the notion that we don't have a choice. So Google has a choice. And in fact, in some of the uh, Patriot Act or 702.215 related stuff, It appears that there is the uh, there's the possibility to appeal, and the FISA court and the Department of Justice recently said no company that had been forced under these rules had actually tried to take that. So there is, in fact, a legitimate legal way to resist, and they do have a choice, and they chose not to use it. That's one. And the second point is you always have a choice. Even if it is an illegal choice, you still have that choice. And to suggest that the range of motions um, is limited there, I think that really bothers me. I mean, there are some people at Google that I say without knowing anything extra when I say this, uh, they, they probably know more than they're letting on. And in fact, they're legally gagged not to speak. So I wonder if you could talk about how some of these people maybe could make a different choice and what the legal penalties would be for some of those companies for making those choices or what you think the water is like temperature-wise for breaking those laws and getting prosecuted? I can't speak to U.S. law, and you know that, but I will happily comment on the rest. Um, so, first off, you're right. Um, I wasn't clear before. What I was trying to say was that Google had this choice, this choice, this choice. They chose the sort of path of least resistance. Um, you're right. Google does have a choice. All of these companies have a choice. As far as the latter part, while I, like I said, I can't speak to the sort of temperature for risk on that, um, Well, I think I think it's pretty clear what such an employee with that kind of information has a choice of, um, and that is that they should come forward. And I do firmly believe that. Um, the risk, obviously, is incredibly high for that person. Um, and I think that's about all I can... I mean, I, we all know what the what the temperature looks like right now, right? Um, I would like to say something about that too, but before we're going to have a follow-up question here and another question there, and I think after that we should, um, there is another one afterwards, and then we should um, stop and <laughs> give you some more beer and food. <laughs> Just, um, and you can hypnotize, uh, but I don't think that there is a, such a big risk for a billionaire CEO in the U.S., to be prosecuted in the US um, for coming forward. So uh, that's my kind of question into the regard, if a Google CEO would come forward and say something like that, what would really happen to him? I mean, first off, I doubt it's the CEO that has that information. So you're not talking about, I mean, it, and please somebody jump in if you think I'm wrong, but my guess is you're not talking about a CEO, you're not talking about somebody with that much power, you're talking about somebody who has, is working on a technical level, has signed something, um, and is actually, you know, actively, physically doing whatever needs to be done in that case. So the risk would be pretty high because I don't think the company is going to take the hit for that person. I can't imagine a company like Google taking the fall for a middle-ranking or low-ranking whistleblower. Why would they? I don't know who knows. I have no I idea who knows. I think I'm pretty sure that the middle management knows what's going on. And when you read some comments from Eric Schmidt, then I don't think they are trying to ignore it at all. 
I, I my think guess. My, my only point is I doubt that it's the people at the high levels of those two companies that have that level of granularity and detail. I could be wrong. I honestly don't know the answer to that question. Uh, the risk is also if you're a billion dollar company and you're a CEO of a billion dollar company and you go up against the US government, you're suddenly a one penny company. So they'll just shut you out. Oh, I mean, I, if Eric Schmidt were to actually be the one to come forward, I think you're, I, you might be right. I just don't think that's, I don't, A, I don't think he has the kind of information that would be needed, and B, I don't see that happening. He's a, he's a something. To not say that into the microphone. What about David Drummond, um, the chief legal guy? I mean, he's probably a stockholder, and presumably he has to actually read these legal documents. And I mean, we can probably divide these kinds of um, scumbags into two categories. So scumbag zero, um, that's the sort of people who work for the NSA but then take a job and they pretend they don't work for the NSA anymore. I'm sure those people exist in companies. We can't really do anything about them. They're really unlikely to be whistleblowers. They're scumbags. Scumbag one, I think, is good people in a bad system forced to do things. And I think that goes up to the top in some cases. So a list of clearances, people who are cleared to know these kinds of things, read into those programs, and who have the legal authority to sign off. And I think that's the head of Google's legal department, but I could be wrong. So he'd be an interesting guy to talk to. Another question from here. Hi. Um, so, yeah, I guess uh, the idea of, like, you know, confronting the corporations that are complicit in this is, is one side of things. You know, you talked about getting off Gmail uh, or, you know, Facebook or whatever. But, uh, and I've heard, I've, you know, I've talked to some, I'm not a huge technologist myself, but I've talked to some friends who are more involved with this sort of thing than me, and there seems to be mixed uh, opinions about what is technically possible uh, insofar as, uh, you know, the, the NSA actually surveilling communications on a, on a very, like, physical level, you know? So, like, what's, you know, say you have your own, set up your own mail server, you know, and you're sending emails. I mean, to what extent can the, can the NSA actually tap into the physical infrastructure of the Internet and, and monitor these sorts of communications? I, that's something that doesn't get addressed in the media at all. And that's something I'm the wrong person to ask, unfortunately. But if somebody wants to identify themselves as the right person to have that discussion over beers, please. If anybody wants to. Maybe Sorry one person here. It's one idea what's very important. You have to swing the sword of transparency when you are in such a big company, if you are in middle management, you have to keep the information or bring them to the upper management because it's their goal to be not informed. And you have to officially inform them because then they are enforced to do something. So this is something what I keep everybody in mind, what's a good way. We have one more question here. Let me jump thank you <coughs> i i had just a brief question in regard to your initial statement when you mentioned that you have created a list of principles so what these principles are and uh, could you please uh, mention them and um, tell us where they lead or what do you, how do you proceed with them sure um i wasn't prepared to do this without notes i'm so i i'm really sorry if i'm coming across as disorganized in any way like i said hacker camp um <laughs> So one moment, because I don't want to make mistakes here. So you can find them at necessaryandproportionate.net. Um, and we have, like I said, um, a little over 150 signatories from around the world. And while I wait for this to load. So, I mean, that'll load in a minute. So the idea behind these principles was to not create anything new, but to look at existing international human rights um, regulations and to apply that as it stands to the uh, to the surveillance of um, online communication and I'm not getting a good um, I'm happy to talk about it after I feel like I, I can't quite <laughs> this is a project that my organization has been working on it's not a project that I've been working on that's sorry I'm 
working on it. Or <laughs> she's just asking to read them out loud. Yes, and I, I mean can't we load. could also um, just try to put them on the wall afterwards yeah, and maybe talk great. about that. And um, Jillian, tell us again where can people find yeah, the yeah. principles so that everyone knows and maybe Twitter it and yeah. It's uh, necessaryandproportionate.net. Yeah. Then we might just afterwards put them on the wall. Yeah, that would be great. And, yeah. And maybe in this, um, talking about that, um, you see the stopsurveillance.org. Um, that's also something that's coming from Digitale Gesellschaft. And ma ma many other organizations in Europe and Germany have joined. And um, please have a look at that too. There are also uh, 13 principles. And um, it's nothing, you know, not yeah, almost you can compare it in a way, but more from the German and European side yeah, than but from we're, the we're signatories yeah. of that one as well. And I mean, I mean, basically the idea behind a lot of the work going on around those principles, these principles, is to pare back, to think about only and and this is even hard for me because I take a slightly more fundamentally opposed to surveillance stance um, than uh, than I think a lot of us in policy do. But nonetheless, the idea is to encourage the pullback of any sort of dragnet surveillance. Um, and the aims are for only, you know, targeting for legitimate purposes, for criminal law enforcement, et cetera. Um, so you can look at the, oh, these that's are the, ours. Yeah, that's, the that's yours. <laughs> our open letter. Sorry, that's yours. Um, and then we can put ours up later as well. But they're not ours, it's a group. Yeah. You have, ah, great. Oh, mine loaded too. Do you really want me to read them all? Yeah, I'm like it's very hot. No, let's not do that. <laughs> I think Jillian, when I was up there a couple of minutes ago, you were sweating even more than all of us together. Oh, so come on. I feel like you're on the spot right now and I don't want to grill you anymore. So if there's any very important question right now that has to be asked and um, there is a need of Jillian uh, giving an answer to right now and uh, for all the people online, then please one more and then I'm going to... Close up. Thanks. Thanks. Um, several days ago, I was reading that there are also other institutions that want to get their hands on the data of the NSA, and the NSA is refusing to hand out the data. So I think it might be interesting to see some war of institutions forthcoming who are fighting for getting their hands on the data. And I would be curious to know if there's any discussion in that direction going on in America, or that if you already like have that on your sort of public radar, like who who should have access to all this data and who should have possibilities to, yeah, exploit them or run their algorithms on them or whatever. I'm not sure I completely understand the question. So I mean, just in terms like. Who gets the data once someone has... Yeah, sort of. I mean, um, I read that NSA is refusing to hand out data because if it's not for the sake right. of terrorism, they, they close everything down. So there were some institutions that were they're, they're fighting against uh, drug cartels and they said drugs are used to finance terrorism so they should have access to the data and they were refused to get access to the data. Wow. So... Yeah, ho however, I mean, everybody's desperately trying to, to get hands on their data with whatever arguments are coming up. And I think it, it might be interesting to see how the definition of terrorism and the definition of what NSA is uh, collecting their data for, I think it's, it's a forthcoming discussion that's in the air right about now. So I would, I would like to know if, if there's already sort of something like in that direction on your radar, like activist radar in the, um, in, in the US. So I'm afraid to say not on my radar, but o again, only because I, I've literally been offline for the past two weeks. So I'm, I'm two weeks behind on a lot of the, the activism that's happening in the US right now. Um, I'm sorry about that one. Okay. 
Thanks, Jillian. Sorry for saying that you were sweating, but I know how it felt being there. And <laughs> I think all of us are only, you know, able to listen for quite a while and answering questions is, is quite tough and going to Ohm before. <laughs> Hard one. So thank you very, very much. I hope, um, though we weren't talking too much inside, we're able to even talk much more outside with a fresh drink and some food. Another, you know, I just want to ask you again, there is a little ball and um, if you eat a sausage or some something else, then please just put some money in there and support us in that way if there is a chance for you to do so. And yeah, just um, join us next time. Always first of uh, first Tuesday in a month. Next one is uh, September fourth, I guess. And um, next time also with Tactical Tech. Thanks for being here and um, many others. And maybe the weather isn't that great, and we're yeah even able to think a bit more. So thanks for joining us and um, have fun.